everybody. Uh, welcome to Zubi Lecture Series. My name is Frank Sleges. I'm Professor of Landscape Architecture, and I'm organizing this um, this uh, great talk uh, that's based on an uh, endowment from uh, Irv and Maggot Zubi. And uh, we're very happy to, like today, invite world-class speakers, internationally diverse. And um, I will just take one minute to uh, announce the uh, next, we have actually two, two uh, lectures next week. One is joined with the architecture department and I will announce them. And I think I'm gonna put them in a chat too. Um, so uh, one is uh, on Wednesday, uh, November 4th. And we have a pleasure to have Farshid Musavi, principal of uh, Farshid Musavi architecture. I hope I pronounced it right. And, um, a lecture and a conversation. And uh, we, we can't co-sponsor this with the Department of Architecture. I think it's gonna be a great lecture. So please join Wednesday, Wednesday, four o'clock. Uh, the next day, uh, we have a Thursday, Thursday uh, on that normal schedule, uh, to Thursday at four o'clock, Lindsay K. Campbell, a research social scientist from the USDA Forest Service. And she talks about construction of nature in New York City, governance, discourse, and materiality. So that sounds uh, great too. I will uh, put uh, these both in the chat, and I will um, now hand it over to um, to Jack. Hi, Jack. Hello, Frank. Thank you. Um, welcome everyone for our uh, Zuby talk today. Uh, it's my pleasure to in introduce our speaker today, Neil DeBoll. Um, I've known Neil for 20 or 25 years uh, and I have come to respect him uh, very much for his knowledge and for the work that he does with native plants. Uh, Neil started this all with a bachelor's degree in environmental science from the University of Wisconsin. Um, and after a couple of stints in, um, in government work, he started uh, Prairie Nursery, um, which is currently a, a major national supplier provider of native plants and seed. So he really knows all these plants that he'll be talking about today uh, as, a, as a farmer, as a horticulturalist, and as an ecologist. Um, Neil has developed a number of seed mixes and plant gardens for application of native plants to the designed landscape. He's a great friend of landscape architects. Uh, and he likes to think that his, his plantings include a focus on integrating people, plants, and wildlife. He's recognized internationally as an expert in ecological and natural landscape design. And he's won numerous awards for his work. He's spoken widely throughout the US, Canada, and in Europe. Uh, and he's written a number of important articles on um, native plant horticulture. Neil has also consulted for the National Park Service, the National Arboretum, many state highway departments, um, the International Peace Garden um, at the border of the US and Canada. Neil, Neil is a true champion for native plants and biodiversity. From his early career to today, he has developed a deep knowledge of native plant ecology and horticulture. He's the go-to guy for advice and consultation. And I know this from firsthand experience. Um, he, has, um, he and his staff have helped me uh, many times on, on prairie and meadow projects that I have been working on. And most recently, he generously uh, helped with a research project I completed last year for the Massachusetts Department of Transportation for using um, native grasses and wildflowers on the state roadsides. Neil has been a hero of mine since I first heard him speak 25 years ago. It's a real pleasure to host him here at UMass for this talk today. Um, please join me to give Neil a very warm UMass virtual Zoom welcome. <laughs> Can you hear the crowds, Neil? Yeah. <laughs> Loud and clear, Jack. Good. Take it away. Thank you so much. So, um, I'm going to give you a 40 year perspective here. And it's an interesting process to watch the world change. Um, I became 
really involved in the environmental movement when I was 16 years old during the first Earth Day in 1970. And in 1975, I quit college for a year to become an environmental lobbyist in the Wisconsin State Legislature to coordinate all the anti-nuclear power groups in the state and anti-coal power plants. And we championed the development of alternative energies such as solar, wind, as well as energy conservation. And everybody calls us fools, idiots, and dreamers. And now, <laughs> finally, <laughs> 45 years later, it's all coming true. But I learned when you are dealing in the political realm as a lobbyist, and I was an unpaid lobbyist, I, I, I financed this myself, I learned that um, it's a blood sport. And when you're dealing with politics, and this was 45 years ago when it was actually a much nicer, uh, much nicer interaction in the political world. Democrats and Republicans would argue in the chambers and then they would go have dinner together and that's where the business got done. That's no longer the case. But I learned that basically when you're dealing with politics, you have to destroy them before they destroy you. And that's really not a very nurturing way to get things done. And I don't think you're really gonna change the world by fighting by those rules. So I decided to go into a more productive and nurturing direction. And that was growing native plants and espousing respect for all species on the earth and the planet because without that, we're toast. So I think we're starting to learn that uh, slowly, grudgingly, and it may be too late, but hopefully not. And that's really the gist of what I'm gonna talk about today. But the changes that I've seen in the last 50 plus years have been immense. And it used to be, we just, we just wanted to preserve land so it wasn't developed. And that nature would take its course. Well, look what nature does when it takes its course. We have all sorts of issues with invasive plants on our public lands, and we don't have budgets to control them. We have huge issues with climate change and the effects that it's having on our native plant communities and natural communities. Continued loss of habitat due to agriculture, urban development, suburban development, and extirpation and extinction of increasing number of species. And what certainly seems to me, a lack of social commitment to biodiversity. People are so tied up in their, their homocentric needs. And especially with the pandemic, it makes it even clear that people are scared, they're afraid of what's out there. And there doesn't seem to be a real emphasis on taking care of the environment because everybody's so concerned about just surviving this. So what I'm gonna talk about today are the American Garden a life or death situation. This is not uh, a happy topic. It's the Donnie Downer version, but there is hope. So without further ado, I would like to go into my slide presentation and we will go from there. Okay, come on, come on, come on. Okay. So this is truly, in my opinion, a life or death situation. I think most of you would share that opinion that what we're dealing with now is potentially a turning point for biodiversity on the planet and ultimately the survival of our species and so many others. And the thing that so few people appreciate is our interdependency and reliance upon functioning ecosystems with a lot of different moving parts. And you can only kick out the props for so long and then the whole house of cards falls down. But what can we do as individuals? Well, we can start on our own properties. And that's really the focus of today of how do we make changes outside of the external forces that we have no control over and they are significant. So what can we do individually and as, as a society? So what is the garden? What is the purpose of the garden? Different gardens have different purposes. A food garden, your vegetable garden. Maybe you just like flowers. Maybe you wanna plant some trees for some shade create a sanctuary, natural beauty, all these lots of good reasons to have a garden. So what is the American garden? Now I can get a bunch of different answers, but I'm gonna give you my perspective. I think many of you will probably agree that, with this, but first and foremost, the number one American garden is the lawn, the fifth largest crop in the United States after corn, soybeans, wheat, and hay, lawn. Lawn consumes an area the size of the state of Pennsylvania in the United States of America. That's a pretty big crop. 
That's a lot, a lot of acres. That's square miles and square miles and square miles of lawn. And tomatoes. <laughs> Who doesn't grow tomatoes? That's our favorite crop. Okay, everybody has tomatoes, right? Even if you just have a just one little bucket of dirt on your porch, you're going to put tomatoes in there. So that's an important part of the American garden. But what I see more and more, more and more popular and more and more problematic, in my opinion, is mulch beds. Is this the classic all-American garden? A big pile of mulch with a few plants stuck in there. Why is this? It makes no sense whatsoever. And if anybody's ever gone to England and you've seen English gardens, how much mulch do they use? You don't see mulch in an English garden. And why is that? Because the English understand the morphology of their plants. They understand the root systems. They understand the foliar zone. They understand all the pieces of putting together a garden and how the plants interact and when they're going to be active and what roots will work with other roots, tap roots, with fibrous roots, with rhizominous roots. Mulch is for the lazy person who knows nothing or cares nothing about the actual plants themselves. It's simple, easy, and stupid, just like the lawn. Why is lawn so popular? Because you mow it, you spray it, throw some fertilizer on it. Hey, it's in the book. We can do this. You don't really have to know a whole lot. But there's other reasons too, okay? We have the tyranny of the lawn, which is a silent socioeconomic contract, and we'll get into that a little bit later. And biophobia, fear of the natural world, bugs, bees, and bacteria. And what's interesting, having been in business almost 40 years now, and having worked with prairies for over, for over uh, 45 years, is when I started out in business, I couldn't give this stuff away. They were all weeds. Nobody wanted them because native plants were not considered of value. The plants of value were the plants from Europe or from Japan or from wherever, foreign plants. So we, we literally starved for years and years and years trying to sell native plants back in the 80s. And for 20 years, a lot of people wouldn't buy native plants because they attracted bees and someone could get stung. Well, now everybody's planting plants for bees. And now we're beyond the bee phase. We're into the native uh, other pollinators, including pollinating and parasitic wasps, flies, bats, all sorts of creatures, which now finally people are starting to welcome into their garden. So it's a very positive sign, but it's grudging and slow. There are still a lot of people who have serious cases of biophobia and don't want any of these things in their yard. And we're human beings. Human beings are a social species. Pretty much follow the herd. So that's one of the reasons why change is so slow. But where did this social contract with the lawn come from? Let's look at the history of the lawn. Okay. The lawn is, by all accounts, an English creation and mostly created by sheep because they grazed around the manor houses of the 17th, 18th, 19th century in, in England among the wealthy. So with the rise of the middle class in the latter part of the 19th century after the Civil War, what we found were people with money were moving to the suburbs of New York, Philadelphia, Boston, et cetera, on three, four, five, ten, 10, or multiple acre properties and building larger homes. And what was their model for a landscape? England. And what model did they select? The English lawn. And what is the importance of the lawn? Why do people want to have this? Well, first and foremost, it was the archetypal landscape of the wealthy. And if you've got three or four acres of mowed lawn, you can tell everybody just by your lawn, I've got so much money, I can have a completely useless landscape that costs more than it, than it produces. That gives me status. So this became a social contract among the middle and upper classes that the lawn was the accepted socioeconomic model for your landscape. And those who defy that would pay a serious, serious price. So they were shunned and they became the the pariahs of their neighborhoods. And I remember when we first started working with native plants and people would put prairie gardens in their yards, there were lawsuits after lawsuits after lawsuits by town ordinances. And you can't have anything over six inches, 12 inches, 18 inches, 24 inches, no matter what it was. And of course, then we would counter that in court, but then you'll have to cut down all the trees and shrubs because those are also in excess of that height limit. So it was this never ending back and forth with the authorities, which now is pretty much a moot point. And in the Midwest, very interestingly, Prairie landscapes have become a, almost a go-to landscape, especially for corporate campuses and other situations where there are large expanses of land that are not being used at any given time. And one of the primary reasons is not just ecological or environmental or aesthetic, but economic. Because a properly designed meadow and properly maintained will save the owner 
money over the long term with reduced maintenance, reduced inputs, reduced fertilizers, pesticides, no irrigation. You would take away all of these costs that are fixed costs or annual costs that you have to apply to a more traditional lawn type landscape. And so you can save tens of thousands of dollars over the lifetime of that landscape. And you talk to a CEO who is in charge of making these decisions and say, your amortized cost of that prairie is one fifth of your lawn. So they can understand that in financial terms. So that's a big selling point, not to mention the ecological and environmental advantages as well. And this is what we have to focus on, not just the environment, but how can we use these native landscapes to, not just to create habitat, but to also save money and to create value in the landscape. And we'll get into some of those values that are created in a while. So what are the costs of this American garden? As we'll see, loss of land and habitat, environmental degradation, lack of pollinators, birds, et cetera, disruption of food webs, and soulless conformity, soulless conformity. How everybody can do the same thing in their yard is beyond me. And when I was a kid, I had to mow the lawn on our little lot in St. Louis, Missouri. And when I was about 12 years old, I asked my parents, can we just plant the lawn to alfalfa so I only have to cut it three times a year? Uh, needless to say, that was vetoed. But looking for an alternative to this stupid, stupid landscape, even though we have better alternatives than planting our lawns to alfalfa now, but that was the only alternative I could come up with at that age at that time. So, so despite recent progress, American gardens are still dominated by non-native plants, minimal habitat for pollinators and vertebrates that form the foundation of the food web. Study in Carlinville, Illinois, right across the river from St. Louis, showed that 50% of bee species were lost between the late 19th century and 2010. 50% of the bee species. And of course, the monarch butterfly, rusty patch bumblebee, and native bees are in decline, along with many, many other species. And as I'm sure everybody knows, one third of the food we consume depends on pollinators to produce fruits and seeds. But what we've seen here is industrial farming has only gotten worse. And we have large CAFOs, confined animal, confined animal operations, where you have large dairies with hundreds or in cases, many thousands of cows with huge waste streams and manure pollution and groundwater degradation and loss of increasing habitat because of government policy subsidizing the production of corn for ethanol. So what we're seeing is this constant destruction of fence rows, woodlots, forest lands to convert them into agriculture and, and just plowing, knocking everything down, burning it up and plowing it up and converting it to corn, beans, etc. Now this was really rampant 10 years ago when the price of corn was artificially increased through a variety of different factors. But now that the price has come back to earth, uh, it's not so much the case. But we lost thousands, tens of thousands of acres of prairie in eastern Nebraska that were plowed up since 2008. And this is when price of corn really started to skyrocket and people just went out and tore everything up. And it's very interesting, there's a, a corollary here, is that these are government supported prices. When a government made a commitment to produce certain amounts of ethanol, to require a certain percentage of ethanol, to be included in gasoline, which the a concept was to reduce dependency on foreign oil. But since the United States is now the world's largest oil producer, the whole purpose of this is moot. But yet that remains part of our policy. So that increased the demand for corn, which then increased the cost of corn for third world countries in, in Latin America, which caused all sorts of economic issues, but that's a separate issue. But what we see has been this huge conversion of what were still the few remaining native prairies out in the Great Plains or the far west of the Eastern Tallgrass Prairie in Nebraska were destroyed and converted to corn because of these artificial price supports created by the government. And if you go back in history and look at what happened during World War I when the United States supported higher prices for wheat, the normal market price was around 25 cents a bushel. The government raised it to a dollar a bushel to support wheat production to send to our soon to be allies, the British and the French, before we actually became involved in the war. And that led to a skyrocketing of planting of wheat. And what else? The breaking of the prairie sod in Western Kansas, the panhandle of Oklahoma, the panhandle of Texas, Northern Texas, Northeastern New Mexico and Eastern Colorado. The prairie was plowed up and wheat was planted. And it worked great from the teens and into the twenties. And then the price was went up to $2 a bushel. The government raised it even higher when we entered into the war. So you had this artificial price support that led to the destruction of the Great Plains grassland and conversion to cropland, i.e. wheat. And the old timers said, don't do this because that land is gonna blow away. 
just kind of dry up and blow away. And by the 30s, that's exactly what happened. Well, arguably, the worst environmental disaster in the history of the nation was caused by government interference in the price, pricing of, of commodities. We're seeing the same thing with corn and ethanol and ongoing destruction of habitat, which now it's pretty much done. The, the tens of thousands of acres that were taken, in fact, more than tens of thousands, 3.6 million acres of grassland converted to corn for ethanol since 2008. 92% of corn and 94% of soybeans grown in the US in 2017 were Roundup ready, meaning that they were resistant to glyphosate. Whereas previously 4% of corn and 17% of soybeans grown only 20 years before in 1997 were Roundup ready. And what are the implications? Well, it used to be that one of the few weeds, quote unquote, that could not be controlled in a cornfield with standard application of herbicides prior to Roundup ready crops was common milkweed. With Roundup Ready crops now, the glyphosate kills the milkweed. So we have these great, great quantities of milkweed plants in our agricultural fields, which supported wonderful populations of monarch butterflies. In fact, some uh, investigators state that the, the peak of the monarch caterpillar, excuse me, the monarch butterfly uh, numbers occurred in the 80s and 90s due to all the milkweed that was available in farm fields. And once these Roundup Ready crops became available, the populations have plummeted. We used to have infestations of monarchs in our nursery in the 90s, and they would get on our, on our milkweed plants and defoliate them. So it was just amazing. And we would pull off the monarch caterpillars and send them to school so they could, when they were mature, we would send them to schools and then they could watch them spring chrysalises and hatch out for new butterflies. Well, we picked hundreds, hundreds, thousands of monarch caterpillars and sent them to schools. So monarch butterfly populations have declined 86%. Between 97 and 2015, there's been a small rebound here in the last few years, but it's been relatively minor. 25% of the native bee species in America, North America and Hawaii are in danger of extinction as of three years ago. And native bees are responsible for pollinating $3 billion of fruit crops, not just honeybees, but native bees are very important. And one of the important aspects of native bees is many of them are cold tolerant. They will fly in the early spring, oftentimes during critical pollination time for fruits. While the honeybees require warm temperatures and will not fly in cold weather, thus reducing the effectiveness of pollination if you don't have the right weather in the early spring. So the question is, will Monsanto, now owned by Bayer, will they develop a Roundup Ready milkweed that we can plant? I doubt it, but wouldn't that be a great thing? It's probably totally simple, I think, to insert the Roundup Ready gene because that's what they do. And I actually met the fellow who discovered the Roundup Ready gene, who worked for Monsanto. And he saw there were these alga growing in a waste pond where they expelled all this glyphosate. And he said, my goodness, that alga is doing quite well. And he did some investigation and actually extricated the, or extracted the Roundup Ready gene. And he is the guy that found it. And then Monsanto used it to uh, implement their various Roundup Ready crops. So why not Roundup Ready milkweed? Perhaps worse, are neonicotinoids. And everybody knows the problems with neonicotinoids, but when you look at the numbers, it's absolutely shocking. So let's compare just 2005 to 2011, and the situation has gotten far worse since 2011. In 2005, less than 30% of corn and less than 5% of soybeans were treated with neonicotinoid insecticides applied to the seed. By 2011, those numbers had increased to 79% of the corn and 33% of soybeans. By 2017, the EPA estimated that 100% of U.S. corn crops, with the exception of a few organic growers, were treated with neonic. Perhaps even worse, the concentration of neonicotinoids applied to corn has increased two to five times in recent years. So not only do you have a higher prevalence, you have higher concentrations and higher total application in the environment. And here's the real killer. About 3% of neonics applied to corn seeds are absorbed by the plants. 97% diffuses into the soil. They are highly water soluble. They release into surface waters, groundwater, and can be up, taken up by trees, shrubs, and flowers very distant from the point of application. And they can persist in the soil for up to five years. So just because they're applied on the cornfield doesn't mean they're gonna stay in the cornfield. Or just because they're applied to the seed that's planted in the cornfield doesn't mean it's gonna stay there. It can move large distances. So even though the European and Great Britain are still embroiled in negotiations about their future relationships, they do agree on a near total ban of the use of neonic. But here in America, 
hey, we have freedom. We can do whatever we want, right? So you're not seeing a ban on this, despite the what appeared to be very significant negative impacts on our pollinator habitat and other invertebrates. So how long will we go with this? And you can look at this also with the use of herbicides, particularly highly volatile herbicides like dicamba, which is used widely in the Midwest and farm fields and in the South, in cotton fields in various places. And it is extremely volatile and can travel hundreds of yards or miles into adjacent properties and harm or damage or kill plants. But yet, because of the strong agricultural industry, industry, industry interests and the chemical industries, it has not been controlled. So it's like a wild, wild west out there as far as destruction using pesticides. It's unbelievable that, that we're allowed to do this. So the obvious question is what happens if pollinator populations collapse? And how will our fruits, vegetables, and nut crops be pollinated? Well, it's not good. Farmers will have to, and they are slowly planting pollinator strips of native flowers adjacent to their fields to sustain pollinators and also to control erosion and run off from their fields, including phosphorus, nitrogen, et cetera, which then in the Midwest run down into the Mississippi drainage and create the huge dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, which is destroying the fisheries there as long, along with everything else that would grow in that area due to the anoxic conditions that are created by large algal, algal blooms. And we're working with cranberry farmers in Wisconsin and in uh, Quebec because they're planting pollinator strips between their cranberry bogs. The thing about cranberries is they bloom for about three weeks in midsummer, mid to late summer, and you need to have pollinators there for those three weeks. If there's nothing else nearby, then you won't have pollinators. So strips between the bogs on, usually on the dikes, they're planting strips along the sides of the dikes to bring in pollinators to hold them through the entire growing season. So those pollinators will be available to pollinate their cranberry plants in summer. And very slowly, but gradually here in the Midwest, we're seeing buffer, strap, buffer strips of prairie. Here you see yellow coneflower and Canada wild rye is the grass being planted here between crop fields. And again, a lot of this is used for controlling runoff and pollution into groundwater and surface water, but they also help to uh, retain pollinators, which of course are not important for corn because corn is wind pollinated, but for soybeans and other insect pollinated crops, they are important. And we're seeing a gradual increase in this, but farmers are loath to take land out of production because it reduces their total yield for their farm. But I think this is going to become more and more prevalent because it's a, it's a requirement to maintain the integrity of the environment. So we'll see. What about our parks and natural areas? Well, it used to be that, like I said earlier, you just want to preserve land and everything will be fine. We have our national parks, we have our state parks, we have our natural areas, we have our county parks. What's wrong with that? Well, we don't have the budgets here. Our Department of Natural Resources in Wisconsin has had their management budget slashed. We're seeing all kinds of invasive plants taking over. And federal lands, just look at what's going on in federal lands, especially in the last four years, with pressure from ranchers for grazing, drillers for oil and gas. Uh, if you look at uh, some of the, the battles that are being waged right now, where people, citizens think that those public lands belong to them because they have cows and they can just run them wherever they want, or People in the oil and gas industry say, hey, this is ours to take. And you have these issues with what's going to actually become of these lands. And you have these huge economic interests that are always, always pounding down the door to get at public lands. So it used to be that government institutions, starting with Teddy Roosevelt in the early part of the 20th century, took the lead in conservation, even though Teddy Roosevelt had to use executive orders to preserve land because the Congress was bought off and did not want to participate. And remember that senators were not directly elected by the citizens until 1913. So the Congress that Teddy Roosevelt was dealing with had senators that were appointed by state legislators who were usually completely paid off to pick their guy to go to represent their state, usually by strong, strong industrial or corporate interests. So during Teddy Roosevelt's time, he was find, fighting a very non-cooperative Congress, but he created all these great preserves by executive order and did great things. So the government used to take a lead, but we're not seeing this. And you have this axis of greedy economic and political interests that control large aspects of our public lands. So this is a never-ending battle. And a great Cree proverb, only when the last tree has withered, the last fish caught, and the last river been poisoned, will we realize we cannot eat money. But we're Americans, and we're living in a very materialistic society. And so the almighty buck talks very loudly. 
So we have to make sure that people understand that a strong economy is dependent on a good ecology. So what can we do? We can work for positive political change. Obviously, many of us are working very hard to minimize our ecological footprints. Hey, none of us are flying anywhere anymore, hardly. That's a great thing. <laughs> Air quality has improved in a lot of cities, at least during the shutdown. Unbelievable. And all the wildlife that showed up in, in urban areas was amazing. So uh, that's not so much the case now as things have opened up. But we can still create wildlife-friendly landscapes in our suburban landscape. And we can encourage others by example to go native. And perhaps more importantly is to educate the next generation about ecological gardening. And I think we're seeing that. That is happening either de facto on its own because so many young people are really taking the bull by the horns and saying, hey, we have to make some changes here. This, what is happening now is not working. And I will tell you, 1970, 50 years ago, when I became involved in the environmental movement and made this my life, I was sure we were going to change the world. I was sure we were going to get it fixed. And a lot of things have been improved. We have better water quality, better air quality, but we still have these huge forces, these economic forces that are working at cross purposes to a sustainable economy and a sustainable living environment and a sustainable planet. It's a never ending battle. So the next generation has got to pick up the, pick up the torch and pick up the sword and go to battle against these interests. So what can we do individually? About over 80% over of Americans live in urban areas with populations of 50,000 or more. 35% of the U.S. land mass is urban or suburban. That's just an astounding number. 41% is in farming, and only 24% is undeveloped or not agricultural. 35% of the land mass is urban or suburban. And here we see urban population centers. Northeast, of course, is the, the most, but you have burgeoning population centers in California, Texas, uh, Chicago, Minneapolis, all across the country. 32% of U.S. land cover occupied by suburbia can be converted into native planting. 32%. That's a lot of habitat. And we don't need government programs to do it. Individuals on their own property can do this. Now, why did I go into business in 1982? Because there was this thing called a recession in 1981, 1982, which was the worst recession after, since the Depression prior to the Great Recession. And there were no jobs. So when you can't find a job, what do you do? You make your own job. So that's what I did. And it's amazing to see how long it took to, to make progress in this area. But I was sure that I was going to be a member of the public sector and work for the Department of Natural Resources, work for an Arboretum or a garden center, uh, some sort of a um, nature center. But there were no jobs. And then I realized, you know, there's a huge potential for individuals, private individuals, to do good, to use their land for, for good. And nobody in the government, nobody anywhere was promoting this. And we relied on government entities to preserve land and preserve habitat, but we need to do it ourselves. And so that was a huge motivation was, let's educate the public and let's get people to change the way that they relate to the, to the environment. So they have respect for other species. So they wanna have gardens that really will not just support beautiful flowers, and grasses, et cetera, but support all the creatures that are dependent upon them and create ecosystems on their own property. And that has been my mission and that's been the mission of Prairie Nursery. And it is very encouraging to see the interest that has been growing over the years in this direction. So I have great hope, great hope that this is going to continue and we will see this going into the future more and more. And my dear friend, Laureato, who is no longer with us, who founded Wild Ones Natural Landscapers. Some of you may be aware of this. It's a wonderful group, primarily in the Midwest, but all across, all across the country. She said many years ago, if suburbia were landscaped with meadows, prairies, thickets, forests, or combination of these, then the water would sparkle, fish would be good to eat again, birds would sing, and human spirits would soar. This is classic Laureato. And for those of you who don't know about Laureato, in the early 1960s, she was a Milwaukee suburban housewife, the wife of a doctor, and she was very concerned about the loss of birds in her neighborhood. And then she started doing research. And then she learned about the effects of DDT. And she led the challenge to ban DDT in Wisconsin and was successful. Wisconsin was the first state to ban DDT. And it was Lori Otto that led the charge against it, which then became a national issue. And DDT was banned nationally. So this amazing woman who lived into her 90s 
and passed away a few years ago. She started this great group called Wild Ones. So if you have a Wild Ones chapter near you, I would strongly recommend that you investigate it if you're interested in landscaping with native plants. They're a wonderful, wonderful organization. So approximately 53% of America's 126 million households are considered to be suburban. That's almost 67 million properties that could be native habitats. 67 million properties. This is a lot of territory, folks. Think what we could do on those properties if people planted native trees, native shrubs, native flowers, grasses, sedges, ferns, everything. It would just be incredible. And when you plant this combination of all sorts of plant communities, they complement one another. So the effect ecologically is one plus one plus one equals 10. You create habitat for all sorts of critters. So we plant a combination of deciduous trees, conifers, shrubs, fairy flowers and grasses, woodland flowers, sedges, wetlands, flowers, sedges, grasses, etc. And you have this complementary effect between these different ecosystems, leveraging the value of your landscape. So diversity, diversity, diversity. The leaves of deciduous trees and shrubs support caterpillars of many butterflies and moths. The conifers provide shelter, especially in the winter, but all year round for birds. Prairie and meadow flowers provide nectar for adult butterflies, moths, hummingbirds, pollinators. And the early blooming woodland flowers support native bees, flies, and parasitic wasps. Now, it used to be we couldn't even get people to plant plants because of bees. Now we're getting people to plant native plants for parasitic wasps. I want to attract wasps to my garden. Now, that was a non-seller, non-starter, not that long ago. But a parasitic wasp is different from a predaceous wasp. The only wasp that really bothers anybody is the yellow jacket. All the rest of the wasps, I mean, hornets and mud daubers, you leave them alone, they leave you alone. Okay? They don't want to sting you. They don't want to bother you. You mess with them, of course, they're going to go after you. Only the yellow jacket will sting you just as soon as look at you. But parasitic wasps are usually very, very small. And there is a parasitic wasp that attacks every insect, every, every spider, every mite, every tick. There is something somewhere. And whether it's attacking the adult, the, the eggs, the pupa, the larva, there is something everywhere keeping it in control. And E.L. Wilson said that the Hymenoptera, which includes bees, wasps, uh, these are the little things that keep everything under control the bees, wasps, and of course the ants in the hymenoptera. They keep everything else in control. So parasitic wasps in the garden are a, a tremendous boon. And I had a client many years ago who had terrible problems in his vegetable garden with tomato hornworm. <coughs> and he planted 1,000 square feet of a prairie, prairie mix, <coughs> the smallest amount of seed that we offer. So he had this little 1,000 square foot area of prairies. And as soon as those prairie flowers reached maturity, his problems with tomato hornworm went away. Now, one of the plants that he, that he planted, one of the seeds that was in his mix was a plant called rattlesnake master, Aryngium yuccifolium. Aryngium yuccifolium is pollinated almost exclusively by wasps, many parasitic wasps. So the conclusion is inescapable <coughs> that he had created the habitat for parasitic wasps that attacked his tomato hornworms. And if anybody knows about the, the wasps that attack parasitic, excuse me, parasitic wasps that attack tomato hornworms, they uh, deposit their eggs on the back of the larva of the tomato hornworm, which then burrow into the larva and eat it from the inside out. And it's just like um, that movie Alien. You know, nothing is really original. They got that from, the, from these wasps. So here are these amazing parasitic wasps that are just kind of keeping everything in control. And so many people that are, use organic gardening techniques are using parasitic wasps. So one more benefit of these native plants, an ancillary benefit <clears throat> for your vegetable garden. <clears throat> and of course, wetlands, which we're not even going to go into detail today, but of course they have numerous, numerous benefits, including caching water, uh, as well as creating a whole different series of habitat and supporting different fauna. And if you have not read this book, there's no more important book about native landscaping than Bringing Nature Home by Douglas Tallamy. <clears throat> when this book came out in 2006, it was revolutionary. And there are many of us who sort of kind of thought that, yeah, native plants support more insects, butterflies, et cetera, than non-native plants, but we don't really know that. Well, Doug proved beyond a shadow of a doubt, because he's an entomologist at the University of Maryland. He proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that native plants really make a huge difference 
if you are looking at creating strong ecosystems with biodiversity as a priority. And a few years ago, he came out with a second book called Nature's Best Hope. Again, building on his original book and providing specific ideas and ways to landscape your yard with native plants to create maximum habitat and to support plenty of pollinators, birds, butterflies, etc. So here are some of the findings from Dr. Pellamy. Um, well, this is, first of all, this is just a quick uh, overview. This is pretty basic stuff. Uh, the food pyramid or the food web, there's a lot of ways to look at it. But um, these primary consumers, the insects, are critical for the foundation that are then consumed by uh, birds, mice, <clears throat> amphibians, etc. And then you have tertiary consumers, um, predators, snakes, etc. And then, of course, the top of the food chain, the eagles, the hawks, the owls, and the people, and so on and so forth, and the mountain lions and the wolves, which we don't see a lot of. So here's what Dr. Ptolemy found out. 90% of insects are specialists that depend upon a single genus or just a few genera of plants for food. And why is this? Because plants aren't, quote unquote, stupid. They produce toxins in their leaves that make them distasteful or, or inedible to the insects that eat them. And so certain specialists have developed the ability to neutralize these toxins and they can feed off of those genera or species of plants. But it takes energy in order for those organisms to develop these resistant methodologies of, of, of consuming these plants. So there are a lot of specialists that are taking advantage of their ability to focus on a certain genus or species in order to consume their, their toxic vegetation. Most native insects are not adapted to eating leaves of exotic plants. And they cannot exist without the native plant with which they have co-evolved. This is a this is the foundation of Doug Calamy's finding. So you have these specialist insects that require native plants in order to live. And he found that native plants produce six times as much generalist insect herbivore biomass as non-native plants in one of the studies. Six times. But even more amazing is that native plants can produce up to 35 times as many butterfly and moth caterpillars as non-native plants. 35 times. And if you read this book, he will go through the various woody genera that are particularly good for supporting butterflies, moths, and pollinators in general, starting with oaks, genus Quercus. Amazingly, the willow genus comes in, I believe, at number three, Salix. So it's really pretty astounding if you want to really focus on bringing in butterflies, moths, and other pollinators, what species of woody plants to, to install on your landscape. This, great, this book is great for bringing nature home. Well, let's look at what we can do. We have the great American food desert, and of course, every every landscape needs flowers, like these beautiful petunias right here. And this is pretty typical American landscape, the great American desert, the lawn. But there are alternatives to this. You can have a little bit of lawn in the front, but look at this beautiful prairie garden right around the house. And what a lot of our customers do, they don't convert their entire landscape to a prairie or to a wild landscape, whether it's a woodland or whatever but they will select portions of the landscape in their suburban uh, lots. But some people say the heck with the lot and make their entire suburban lot of prairie. This is a client outside of Chicago and they don't have a stitch of one small part of the lawn where there's a little walkway around their house, but that's it. Everything else is prairie. And so you've got your liatris. This is liatris aspera, rough blazing star, a Midwestern native, little blue stem, Schizocarium scoparium, turning its nice little bluish color later in the season. Uh, Rudbeckias, there's many Rudbeckias from which to choose. Uh, Retibida pinata, yellow cone flower, Echinacea purpurea, purple cone flower, and many other species in their garden. This is a suburban lot west of Madison, Wisconsin. And this is a hillside, difficult to mow, and very dry sandy soil. So rather than bring in six inches of topsoil and plant a bluegrass lawn and install an irrigation system, the client planted a prairie. And the cost of the topsoil was more than the cost of the prairie seed installation. So they're already ahead of the game and no, no irrigation system. And so instead of a boring lawn, they got this prairie and they saved a bunch of money. They saved a ton of money. And that's a very big selling point here is how am I gonna save you money? Not just in the initial installation, but also in the lifespan, the lifetime costs of that landscape. And this is what we have to look at. What are the lifetime costs of that landscape? And a prairie meadow or an Eastern meadow, properly installed and properly maintained 
will outlive the individual who plants it. And I planted trees that are 40 years old, and they're still going strong. And we'll look at uh, we'll look at the best way to maintain these in a little bit here. And here is arguably the first rain garden, which was not called a rain garden, which I designed in 1985 for my then girlfriend's father's yard. And there's a driveway to the right of this that would flood into this area and then go into the backyard. You can see a, a, this little fence back here, a wooden fence, and the water would just flood into the backyard. So I just dug out an area here to collect the water that came off the driveway and then planted moisture adapted species like Veronicastrum, Eupatorium, uh, various others, yeah, Philopendula, and so on and so forth, and captured the water, solving the problem of the flooding in the backyard. And voila, I had a rain garden. Didn't know it was a rain garden, didn't call it a rain garden, but that's what it did. So, uh, and now of course it's become very popular and they're very functional. So we encourage the infiltration of, of the precipitation on site rather than flushing it down into the storm sewers and into rivers and streams that flood and cause other issues. In suburban landscapes, in this case, this individual, why did he plant this prairie? Did he want the beautiful flowers? Yeah, that's okay. Did he want lower maintenance? Yeah, sure. Did he want to keep pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers out of his landscape? You bet. But what was his primary reasoning? His number one reason is he's a bird freak. And he knew that by planting this prairie meadow, that he was going to get all kinds of insects that came to those flowers and his birds were going to eat those insects. So he was looking at it from a complete ecosystem viewpoint. He wanted the whole package, but he really was after the birds and he understood the ecology of a meadow and the incredible levels of insect that they attract and the amazing food source that that provides for birds. And you don't have to just have just a meadow. In this case, you can see we have the compromise of half lawn, half meadow, where we have the lawn being slowly converted into prairie meadow beds, really. So one, every, every year this client puts in a bed. So here's one bed, here's another bed, another bed, and they leave this sort of winding pathways between them in order to enjoy them. So there's many, many different ways to do this. And they have a large landscape. So they wanted to have sort of a compromise situation. And because you're not using all these chemicals, fertilizers, et cetera, these are safe for your kids. And in the almost 40 years I've worked in my nursery, I've never once been stung by a honeybee or a bumblebee because they are our friends. They pollinate our plants. And we love them, and they don't seem to mind us as long as we don't bother them. This is a septic system, which was backfilled with sand and gravel. Rather than bring in topsoil, spend extra money, plant a lawn, we used a very xeric prairie mix com composed of our native lupine, Lupinus perennis, and Coreopsis, Coreopsis lanceolata, and a wide variety of other species that bloom at different times. This is in mid-June. And of course, there's a pantheon of flowers from spring all the way into fall. And this is just what it looks like uh, in, the, in the latter part of spring. Saved a lot of money and created a beautiful landscape. This landscape's been in there for about 25 years and every spring the client calls me and tells me what, how beautiful it is. So it's, it's pretty amazing to see the longevity of a plant community. And that's really what we're talking about here is a plant community. And for corporate landscapes, for large areas like we talked about, I can save you a bunch of money. And in this case, we used a primarily white prairie flower mix, not exclusively, but primarily to match the theme of the building. And if you look at the prairie, there are a lot of yellow flowers late in the season, but in the early part of the season, white is the predominant color. So we can create these white pastel mixes with lots of white flowers, purple, blues, a few pinks, lavenders, et cetera, which is a very understated, but very beautiful landscape. So in a lot of ways you can paint with seed mixes by selecting the desired species and including them in that mix. Golf courses. Golf courses used to be ecological deserts, but they don't necessarily have to be. So here we planted prairies in a variety of locations. This was mostly surrounding um, one of the holes. We used little blue stem in a monoculture with wildflowers and behind that Indian grass, the gold of the Indian grass. So here we are looking at it in late September. These beautiful contrasts, big blue stem here in the foreground with flowers, some of the goldenrods still in there. So we were able to convert the rough into these more attractive prairie meadows. And again, at very low cost on a long-term maintenance program. Here's a view of the uh, 22 acres of little blue stem winding through like a snake with all these flowers through between two fairways on this golf course. And this is called the Meadow Valley Golf Course. That's a Kohler company in Kohler, Wisconsin. And it's a very popular golf course. And this was a great addition to the aesthetics of this course. So 
How about a historical overview, a 38-year perspective? Uh, there may still be yet hope. And as I have said, when I started out, I couldn't give this stuff away. Everything I grew was a weed. The neighbors in, the, in this agricultural community where I live in southwest Wisconsin called us a weed farm. We were kind of a joke. And uh, I invited one of the farmers who was particularly vocal about this. And he was just kidding. He wasn't, he wasn't mean about it. But I said, Howard, you come over and we'll walk my fields. And if there's a weed that occurs in your fields, I will eat it. And we walked acres and acres of fields, and he didn't find one weed that occurs in his fields. He was impressed. So it was all about the education. Got to educate. So I was, at that time, a tree-hugging, dirt-worshipping hippie. And th these were my meager beginnings. And um, I had my hair for a few months. And as you can see, my wardrobe was uh, severely lacking. I started without a penny to my name. I borrowed some money from family and friends, which actually I didn't borrow it. They got ownership of the company, which turned into a pretty damn good deal for them. But I had not a penny to my name, so that helped me get started. But um, <laughs> after a couple of months, I realized this long hair thing wasn't going to work in business very well because sometimes these um, older couples, probably my age now, would drive up and it'd be a hot July day and the man of the couple would get out of the car and the woman would sit in the car and he'd see me and he could hear the door locks click when she saw me. It's like, oh my God, it's a hippie. Oh my God. So I realized, boy, okay, we're in a different zone here. Um, I better cut my hair off. So that was the end of the long hair. Right. So this was our uh, world headquarters in 1982. Bought this junky old trailer and uh, that was that was where I lived for eight years until my girlfriend pried me out of there and moved me into a house. And uh, it was it was a it was pretty meager beginnings. And of course, but we had these great vehicles, the 1973 Honda, and you know those early Hondas were phenomenal at rusting out. And but the real great thing was our staff car, the 1960 Willys utility vehicle. Whoa, with the 5.81 rear end, you could go up a mountain in that thing. I don't know why we would have that in central Wisconsin where we have no mountains, but that's what we had. So that's kind of um, the start of this very meager, humble beginnings. Here was our first catalog. It was just a four page, eight and a half by 11, four page with uh, Latin names and common names and prices. Uh, let's just say um, there was no money to do any marketing. I think we had um, a list of 800 people and that's what we started with our first year. It wasn't very much. And then around 1985, I got this great idea. People don't want eight foot tall prairie flowers and grasses in their yard. But at that time we were doing prairie restorations. That's what this was all about. It was prairie restorations, true ecological restoration where we put as much diversity into those mixes so that we could recreate an ecosystem, the tall grass prairie of the Midwest. Well, people didn't want that. And they said, don't you have anything shorter? And that's when I got this idea. Well, yeah, we'll create a short grass prairie mix, just like out on the Great Plains which is completely different habitat. And you can't grow many tall plants because there's insufficient moisture. The relative humidity is too low and the wind is blowing all the time. So tall species can't survive there. But we can make these survive here because there are many short species that grow in our Midwestern and our Eastern climates. So I created these short grass prairie mixes, which was our first at the time because nobody ever did this. And all of a sudden people said, wow, so I can plant something that only gets three or four feet tall? That's great. And that really helped business because now we had a product that people could use in an urban or suburban landscape. And then we got this idea of plant collections. Hey, we can put together these nice groupings of plants, basically plant gardens. Again, this was uh, at the same time in 1985, trying to realize what do people want to do? Now, I'm an ecologist. I'm not a horticulturalist. I'm not a landscape architect. I'm not a landscape designer. I'm, a, I'm an ecologist nerd. So I, I came to this whole thing from the standpoint of, okay, what is the ecological structure of this fascinating plant community called the prairie? And how can we in, use that in an urban or excuse me, suburban or even rural situation? Well, it took me three years to figure out what people really wanted. That's how uh, our motto was, we got no business being in business because we don't know nothing about business. But finally it was like, this is what the customer wants. We can do this. And that really helped, that really helped. Now we were starting to solve landscape problems, not just create ecological solutions. And then we added color to the catalog and then sales doubled. It's like, yeah, if people can see the color, we're good to go. And then really, like I said earlier, the whole concept here, this is not just a landscape. This is not just a garden. It's a community. It's a plant community. And it goes beyond a plant community. It's a complete ecosystem. Now people are finally starting to realize, hey, we plant gardens, not just for us, we plant gardens for all life. 
And that, that is a huge, huge change in the paradigm of gardening, of creating gardens for all life, not just for human constructs. Now, everybody says they love Mother Nature, but nobody really wants to invite her over to their yard. But that's starting to change. People really are welcoming all sorts of wildlife and pollinators, et cetera. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, development. And so now we have butterfly and pollinator seed mixes, which we've had for many years. And these have been very, very popular. And there's quite a fair amount of diversity, as you can see, in each of these mixes. So we try to have at least 25, 30, 35 species, which will provide um, nectar and pollen for pollinators from spring through fall. So our mission is to change Homo sapiens' relationship with other inhabitants of the planet. And that's really what it's all about. Respect for other life forms and love for other life forms. And ultimately, if we don't, we're gone. So how can we accomplish this in a materialistic world with expanding populations? We have to make the case for ecological landscaping and economics of that. Economics. So, and humans only respond, respond to crises. They seldom take preemptive action. And it's all about the money. But good ecology is a good economy. And we're starting to learn that with renewable resources. This is, a, this is the classic example. People realize, wow, solar makes good economic sense. Wind makes good economic sense. Conservation makes good economic sense. We can really save money while we save the environment. Duh. Yeah, you didn't know that? Why is it taking you so long? And what is the economic value of pollinators? $29 billion in 2010. $16.35 in direct pollination and $12.65 to the seed industry. Huge amount of money. And of course, as we talked about earlier, beneficial parasitic and predaceous insects are estimated to save, far, save farmers four and a half billion in crop losses. And these are old numbers. These are 14 year old numbers. I couldn't find any new numbers. Okay. And birds, by creating bird habitat, birds eat a tremendous number of insects, both beneficial and deleterious, but they keep everything in control. And now one of the great things is the United States Department of Agriculture is financing establishment of prairie pollinator and monarch butterfly seed mixes through their conservation return reserve program over the last five years. And they've got some really good mixes and there are some real allocations of taxpayer dollars to this. So this is one of the better things that uh, Congress has done is pass money for these agricultural programs to convert marginal farmland into habitat. And there's a lot of really great work being done on private lands. So we have to educate, we have to inspire, we have to lead by example. That's what our customers do. And our the neighbors see it and some say, wow, I want that. Others say, well, not for me. But more and more people are saying, hey, I want to try that. And then you have the issue of how do we handle the non-native invaders? Should we ban all non-native plants? Are we going to send all the apples back to Kazakhstan? That's kind of an extremist view. Okay. Um, should we require a minimum percentage of public, at least public, maybe private landscapes to compose a native species? There are developments, suburban developments that require that. In fact, we've worked on developments where only one third of the landscape can be in lawn or non-native plants. Two thirds has to be planted to native trees, shrubs, prairie, et cetera. So if you have a covenant for a development, you can enforce that. It will not be something that would be enforced throughout a community, but at least with on, on private land where people buy private homes, you can do this and it is done and very successfully. Or can we just convince people, hey, this is in your own self-interest. You can have a better landscape with more value and save money at the same time. So really failure is not an option. Okay, so here we are, we're on the sixth extinction. We've had five before. Um, I guess, you know, it's not a big deal. The earth has been around, what, four and a half billion years. We have approximately estimated four and a half billion years of sun left, we're halfway there. So we wrecked the place a sixth time, It'll take a few million years, but we'll re-evolve and you know, there'll be higher life within, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 million years. So geologically, no big deal, okay? And people say, oh my God, we have to save the planet. It's like, don't worry about the planet, the planet's gonna be fine. Better save your own sorry ass because you're going down and you're taking everything with you. Okay, that's the problem. Planet will come back, but you're gonna be gone. So think about that. And Homo sapiens merely awaits its appointment with the sediments, okay? There is no good reason to hasten this process. It's gonna happen, but why do we have to make it happen tomorrow? We could hang on for a lot longer if we just understood stewardship, respect for the earth, respect for our fellow species that we, with whom we share this planet. That's really the bottom line here. And I'm gonna just beat up the lawn a little bit more because it's fun to beat up the lawn. Um, mowing, I hate mowing. That's why we have a product called our No Mow Lawn Mix that requires very little mowing. Uh, here's my feeling about mowing the lawn, like yikes. 
I finally mowed my lawn for the first time in years on my no mow lawn. It was getting, I had a, a few little areas that were just getting a little bit thick. And so I finally mowed it this summer, a small area. And it was, it was, it was nice to mow it. It wasn't nice to mow it, but it was nice to see it mowed. But I hadn't mowed it for probably five years. So what are the alternatives to this? Well, how about a prairie meadow? And instead of the lawn being the go-to maintenance thing, we need a new paradigm. We need a new rite of spring. And I say that should be burning your prairie. Now in the Northeast, burning grasslands is not really a tradition, but in the Midwest, it's a huge tradition. And I know that people in New York, Massachusetts, people who have tried to get burning permits, they have to jump through so many hoops for whatever reason. I have clients who have done this and they've done it successfully, but it's just so terrible. In Wisconsin, you want a burn permit? You go online, you go to Wisconsin DNR, you put in your name and address and your phone number and your email, boom, you've got a burning permit, done. Now, you can only burn when time you're, when you're allowed to, which is after 6 p.m., okay? And because after 6 p.m., temperatures drop, relative humidities go up, wind speeds usually drop, so the flammability of the fuel is greatly reduced. So it's more controllable. When we have a burn ban due to dry weather or high winds, then of course the state lists that on the website. You check the website before you burn and make sure that you're in compliance. Simple, easy, breezy. A few people don't know what they're doing and, you, and they lose their fires and you have wildfires, but it's relatively relatively well, well managed. So here are the tools of the trade for those of you who are not burners. You need your flapper, okay, for controlling the fire line. And you need your, your four gallon uh, tank, water tank with a, uh, with a hose and a, this is the, uh, the way that you apply the water with a trombone slide. And then the most important is the drip torch. 80% diesel, 20% gasoline in this container and it comes down, I'll show you, let's look at the next one, here we go. And so the fuel comes down this tube and then there's a little pad here that holds the fire and you get it set right so it just drips a line of fire. Now here's my no mow lawn, is my fire break. I have this woods back here. If it goes in there, it's going to probably take off. But you know what? I got a five foot fire break of, of grass, no problem. And I've got my flapper here and my water. Okay. So I'm going to use my flapper first and foremost to control the fire and only go to the water in emergency situations. So now I've got a fire line burned in. The wind is coming from the west to the left to right. And the fire, I start from right to left against the wind. And you can see it's slowly creeping so it doesn't get out of control. Always, this is called a back burn or a backfire. So everything is completely in control. Once that black line is burned, there's no way that fire is going to jump that because there's no fuel left. Completely, completely, utterly under control. This is a short prairie. There's not a lot of fuel. I could show you some big fires that are way more exciting than this, but this is what the average homeowner would normally encounter. Now, as I said, it's burning after 6 p.m. So it's getting darker. And actually, sometimes it's difficult to burn because the temperatures are low and the, and the moisture and the fuel increases. But I've got this black line all the way along here. I'm doing this by myself. But it's all burned in. Look, it's burned in 25, 30 feet. So this is all safe. And I'm slowly burning along. And then I'm going to burn uphill a little bit. And burning uphill is more fun because it preheats the fuel. And again, this is a baby fire. This is really not much of a prairie fire. But when you get that fuel preheated, it zooms up that hill and it becomes a little more fun. Okay. Got a little habit, a little activity. But if you're looking, why are we burning? Okay, it's a number of reasons why we burn prairie meadows. Number one is to reduce invasion by woody species, trees, shrubs, vines, et cetera, which can take over the grassland. Number two, we have a number of issues with cool season weeds and grasses like quackgrass, brome grass, fescues, bluegrass. Bluegrass is a weed in the prairie, white clover, red clover. There are numerous cool season weeds that come up first thing in the spring, while many of our prairie species or meadow species are warm season species and will not emerge until four to six weeks until after the cool season species start to come up. So the cool season species will start to gain ascendancy early on and take over the growing zone, both the rooting zone, the foliar zone, nutrients, moisture, et cetera. And so when the warm season prey species emerge later, they're already at a, at a disadvantage. So what we do is we wait until those cool season species are up about four weeks after they've come up, but before the warm season species emerge and we burn them back to the ground. So normally that cool season species may be four, five, six inches tall, and we burn them back to the ground. So they now have not had much time to photosynthesize with the new growth, which required the consumption of their root reserves to generate that new spring growth. Now we burn that back before they've had an opportunity to get any return on investment to photosynthate and renewal of the root, uh, root reserves. So they are at a disadvantage from a standpoint of total energy. Now the soil is black 
and black soil warms up faster, thus encouraging the growth of the warm season heat loving native prairie flowers and grasses and disadvantaging the cool season species which prefer cooler temperatures. So we get a multiple duty benefit from that fire. And then a couple weeks later, uh, it's starting to green up. Here comes the prairie and all those cool season dudes are kind of knocked back. The woody plants are burned back. And what I have found is that invasive woody species we have particular problems with common buckthorn, uh, tartarian honeysuckle, autumn olive, and a variety of others. Uh, what I found is that if you burn on a two year cycle in the spring, normally burn in the spring, uh, there are some situations where you would burn in the fall. A fall tends to be a more neutral fire, doesn't control the cool season weeds and grasses as well. But uh, normally if you wait until in our area, usually late April, early May is when we're burning. We're in zone four, USDA zone four. It will vary from year to year as far as the timing and the emergence of plants based upon the spring weather that year. But if you burn on an every two year cycle, we find that very little woody invasion can occur. The plants are killed, the woody plants are killed if they're only two years old. If you burn on a three year cycle or longer, the mortality rate for those woody invasive plants is greatly increased, or is greatly reduced. So you get just a three year burn cycle instead of a two year burn cycle, you're gonna to start to see survival of those woody plants and much more maintenance required because now you're gonna to have to go in and cut those to the ground and probably apply an herbicide to the cut stump in order to keep them out of your meadow. Now this is particularly even more difficult in the Northeast where you have higher rainfall, cooler temperatures. So meadow management is really important. Burning is our most important tool for, for managing meadows. We use mowing as an alternative where we will mow right down to the soil level, assuming it's not a rocky site and we won't wreck our mowers. So we mow right down to the soil and then remove the burned material, if at all possible, to expose the soil, thus mimicking the effects of fire by removing all the thatch material that would insulate the soil from the solar insulation, solar uh, heating of the soil. And we're cutting as much of those cool season weeds and grasses right down to the ground to remove the highest percentage of their new growth to deprive them of the, uh, of the photosynthetic area that they have generated at that point. But mowing is about 50 to 60% as effective as burning. So if you really wanna get good control, especially of woody plants, burning is your best option. And so here we have it, a few weeks after burning, this is my front yard, a few weeks after burning, and here we are in late June. So the Asclepias, the Echinacea, et cetera, have all really started to come on. This is a 55-year-old prairie, so it's well-developed. And this is what I see here in early July. So the pale purple cone flower, Echinacea pallida, Asclepias tuberosa, the butterfly weed orange, and Parthenium integrifolium, the wild quinine. Here you have this beautiful pastel color, purples and whites. You can create these beautiful prairie meadows with purples, blues, and whites, and just wonderful, stunning landscapes. In the fall, the yellows are going to take over, but there are other species that you can mix with them, including pinks. And pinks and yellows can be very nice complementary colors in your late season prairie meadows. So this is just a, a small example. I would be more than happy to go through the details of how to create prairie meadows, but that's not what my talk was about today. It was more about how are we going to turn the tide on, on the destruction of our environment. And what I believe and firmly believe, and we are seeing, is that individuals can play a role in this process on our own properties. So. That's about it. Here's our contact information, and I would be happy to entertain any questions if that's part of the program. I can start off the questions, Neil. Um, th thank you for uh, for your talk. It's um, as as you uh, as you warned us. You know, it's it's um, it's not a happy story in 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 the big points, but um, I think you do offer hope, and and I share your your belief and your hope that there's a great potential for uh, suburbia um, to, to turn the corner and to contribute in a positive way. Um, I'm asking a question on, on behalf of the audience who I think might be interested, but um, you know, I've learned from uh, the School of Hard Knocks that uh, establishing prairies is um, not as easy as, as many Many of your competitors uh, like to make it think, you know, the, the meadow and the can idea. And, um, you know, it leads to a lot of frustration and a lot of failures, both which, which uh, reflects badly on professionals and um, also uh, clients become disillusioned. Um, so, you know, and I know that I, I don't want to ask you to, to do a whole other talk on establishment, but maybe 
maybe just a few um, a few key points for um, you know the the biggest mistakes to avoid uh, in establishing a meadow, something like that. Sure. Um, boy, what did I do here? Here we go. Uh, I seem to have somehow. Oh, there we go. So, um, yeah, a lot of people oversell this and make promises that are unsustainable and really inappropriate. And I tell my clients that this is a five-year commitment to do this right. And in many cases, if you're dealing with an overgrown old field that's completely infested with invasives and non-native cool season weeds, grasses, et cetera, you are going to have a two-year process of site preparation only just to change the structure of that vegetation, to get rid of what's there, two years. So you're getting rid of the existing perennial vegetation, and then you're also gonna do your best to reduce the amount of weed seed in the seed bank in the second year. And there may be some residual perennials that survive the first year. And there are many ways to do site preparation. You can use herbicide, which is actually usually the most effective and the most uh, least costly, but you can also use soil tillage on level areas, repeated soil tillage every three weeks or so, which is the way I started, because I started off organically and I would go out with cultivators and rip the diseases out of the plants every three weeks. And you can kill all the perennials, depending on the species, but really tough perennials, you can kill them in one season by doing that. But the problem is every time you rip the ground up, you're bringing up new weed seeds. But point being is that you're looking at, in some cases, two years of site prep. If it's a lawn, you can smother it for three months or you can spray it once with glyphosate and you're ready to go. So it all depends on the situation, but the client expectations have to be appropriate with the situation in which you're working. And you have to be totally upfront with them. And we always are, this is what it's gonna take. So you have to know what you're getting into. Then, because these are perennials, the first year, they might only grow a few inches tall and the weeds are gonna grow six feet tall. So you have to keep them mowed back. So you're gonna be mowing three or four times in the first growing season at a height of six inches above the seedlings not letting the weeds get more than 12 inches tall. So you're going to be out there mowing. And in the second year, we typically have problems with biennials. So this is, excuse me, this is the first year after seeding and the second year after seeding. And so then we're mowing at 12 inches two to three times in the second year. And you're not having any flowers until the second year, probably when biennials like Black Eyed Susan start to bloom. So people oftentimes look out the first year and just see a bunch of weeds and give up. But now we have really educated our clientele. People now understand 25 years ago, this was a hopeless sale 35 years ago, trying to convince people to do this. Well, I'll be dead by then. <laughs> I can't wait five years. I said, but wait a minute, you're creating a plant community. This is not just a garden. You're creating a plant community. It's going to live for years and years and years and years. And now people, they get it. They understand it. There's enough experience that people really, really get it. And we've been trying to educate people for the last 40 years on how to do this. And I think now it's just reached a level of acceptance as long as people really understand what they're getting into. And it's a long-term value that they get in return for the upfront yeah. cost. That's really it, the long-term value. Good. Well, well thanks. Yeah, that, I think, um, you know, not, not only the, the clients of, of our prairies, but the landscape architects and landscape professionals, I think really need to um, add this expertise to their, um, to their repertoire, you know, the, because few of them um, know how to do this, um, and but while but there's a growing, you 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 are described very clearly that there's a growing demand for this, and obviously a need for it. <coughs> so there's a big op there's a business opportunity. I think I like to try to make the business opportunity to design professionals that there's a lot of money to be made by by learning how to do this right, and people will will uh, go for it. Absolutely, and you, and you know, Jack, we, we work with hundreds of landscape architects and we just walk them through the whole process even people who have no experience with this <coughs> so we try to serve as a resource for people who are in the design phase of the process to assist them through that that's a big part of our mission good um nathan do we have any other questions yes we have two questions and by the way neil i you're i think you're sharing the wrong screen right now we see your web browser that's on the umass page oh. i don't know if you meant to share something else i oh, know i don't know what i'm doing <coughs> Okay. Um, Let's oh see. <laughs> you can, yeah. You can, say st stop share. Yeah, press stop sharing. Uh, stop share. Okay, here we go. And and then um, open up the app you want to share, and then start sharing again. Uh -oh. <coughs> yeah. And um, we do have um two. 
we do have two questions from the audience. Uh, earlier, Sandy Phillips had a question, and now, um, uh, right now, it's um, Anna Kellerman. I'm going to give people the ability to unmute. Please be polite, and so you can unmute. But um, yeah, uh, Anna and Sandy, um, I don't know who wants to go first. Like, I don't know what, what your schedule is, so maybe one of you can just um, start unmute your mic and ask Neil. Um, yeah. Hi, Neil. Thanks so much for your lecture. Um, I was just wondering about, um, you know, designing with native plants, gardening with native plants, um, and the issue of like e ecotypes and, um, you know, like using native plants here in New England that are native to New England versus native plants that are native to, say, the Midwest or other parts of the U.S. I know that that can be kind of controversial and I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Well, you know, I just I gave uh, this lecture yesterday for the Environmental Landscape Association, um, just west, just east of you, and it was on plant plant diversity and genetics. And there's no question that local ecotype is a significant factor. And when you move plants too far north and south, they're maladaptive as you go north and south because of the photo period, uh, climate, etc. And you have issues of east to west that are associated with relative humidity, wind speed, uh, all sorts of climatic issues as, as well. And sometimes soils come into play. So uh, there's no question that ecotype is an important factor. And the general rule of thumb historically has been that if you move plants, you can move plants about two to, two to three degrees latitude north or south of their point of origin before they become um, not a malad maladaptive to the habitat. And what we see is that when species are moved from north to south, if you go too far, they, they have a longer growing season. They get taller, they get leggy, they have more problems with fungal diseases. Uh, there's, and this is particularly true in the southeast where you have more rainfall, higher relative humidity. And when you, plant, when you move plants from south to north, they have insufficient growing season to produce viable seed. So you might actually be able to grow the individual plant in a more distant location, but will it actually survive as a reproducing viable population. So ecotype is a really important factor. I think there's a lot of, of genetic plasticity in plants that we don't appreciate. And it's really on a case by case, species by species basis. But obviously it's always best to uh, access plants from your, from your local region. Now things are changing with global warming and we don't really know what the implications are going to be. And one of the topics that, that we discussed yesterday for the Ecological Landscaping Association was assisted migration of species from south to north. But you still run into these issues of photo period and ability for those plants to be able to produce viable seed because the season is shorter. So there's a lot of unknowns and usually um, evolution of plant selection occurs over extended periods of time. And we're dealing with a very compressed uh, period of time here or time frame when people are talking about moving plants now. So normally those migrations would occur over extended period of time but we don't have the migration corridors because they've been disrupted by farming and development. So the ability for plants to move and even animals to move, non-flying animals, is reduced to some degree, but particularly for plants because those migration corridors have been disrupted. Thank you. I have a question. Neil, yeah. great, great inspiring talk. Uh, I mean, really, I think there's really some gaps here, right? How we educate today. And uh, so there's a lot of, as, as Jack mentioned, a lot of potential um, to, yeah, it's, it's very useful. It's, it's meaningful. It, it has benefits for the ecology and large numbers. Um, and you have been working in prairie landscapes, which at least is what, what I, um, or mo mostly. And um, so how could, like, uh, is it applicable to other landscapes, let's see, where that are not prairie landscapes, you know, they're not that dry. And then maybe even more specifically, uh, because I had written down the question, how do you maintain those and those landscapes? And you answered the question, like you said, we well, burn them and things. So um, how could that apply to other landscapes that are smaller, like, let's see, in, in more urban areas? Yeah, yeah. Obviously. Because the maintenance is really like, if you don't maintain it, it's it's not going to be as beautiful. It's going to be a disaster. Exactly. You're absolutely right. And you know, when I design a landscape, I do it backwards. 
I asked the client, how are you going to maintain this? And nothing is designed until we have the maintenance program in place because everything is going to be dependent on what can you actually do to maintain this. So, and we can use mowing pretty effectively, not nearly as good as fire, but like as I said, 50 to 60% is effective, which is good enough for maintaining metals. It really is, but it's not going to be as, as good as, as, as fire. And oftentimes it can actually, depending on if you're doing it yourself, it can be, well, the costs are usually fairly similar if you're doing it yourself. But the cost of having a burn crew come in can be fairly uh, fairly high. So it's only feasible on larger landscapes where you're burning multiple acres. But in urban situations where you can't burn, although I will say this, I serve as a burn boss for parks and corporate campuses in the city of Milwaukee and downtown Milwaukee. And we get permits to burn right in the city. So there's a different relationship here in our region with, with fire and landscapes than it is in the east. But uh, we've had no problems obtaining those permits as long as you have a burn plan that you submit to the, to the appropriate entities, which is in this case, the fire department. So, but to answer your question, uh, there are situations where a prairie landscape is not appropriate. And we really need to be focusing on a more woodland landscape with trees, shrubs, et cetera. And then I, as I mentioned, I didn't go into detail. You wanna have as many of those elements of the native landscape as possible together. The trees, the shrubs, the prairie flowers, the grasses, whatever because now you have that, the, those interactive elements that support all stages of the life cycle of pollinators and various other um, critters also. But um, you have to make sure that you have a management plan that can be carried out before you even begin the design process if you're dealing with a meadow. If you can't mow it and you can't burn it, then don't do it. Yeah, right. I think that's important too, because I mean, I, I work a lot with plants also like, I mean, perennials 20 years ago I lost that kind of skill a little bit I mean it takes a lot of practice to to do these things you know like about plants I, like it, it's a skill that's really not like e easy it's, it's it's much more difficult than lawing a mom well <laughs> much more <laughs> difficult <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and here's the thing as I, as I touched on with the English garden, the same is true of a native landscape. It requires a much higher level of knowledge yeah. because you have to know what's, what the members of that plant community are and how they integrate. And since we are not a nation of gardeners, we really aren't. We compare to, to, to and, I mean, England is the obvious comparison, but um, in Germany, uh, you have tremendous gardeners in Germany. So in other parts of Europe where you have a very highly educated uh, populace and really some fine botanical gardens scattered throughout the country. But in the United States, the average gardener um, doesn't really delve into the depth of, of the ecology of the plants in their garden. And that's what we're trying to do is to help people understand the ecology of these plant communities, whether they're woodland communities. And, we, and I do work with other plant material, not just prairies, but you point out that is my, my area of expertise. It's so important to know the specifics on these plants, which means you need to have a love of plants in an understanding of the plants and not every gardener is going to do that. And that's why we create these seed mixes and these gardens that they just plug in and make it easy for them. But again, you have to be able to maintain it. Neil, I'm in Albany, New York and have a perennial garden. Um, I've also had the good fortune to discover and become a volunteer on a prairie restoration in Northern Illinois at Nechusa Grassland. Oh my goodness, wow. And so, Every year, except this year, in the fall, I have gone to do that work. Um, my garden at home is um, kind of a beginner, was a beginner's garden with buying one of these, one of those. Um, milkweed has come up and I mean, really triples every year. <laughs> I try to keep it under control because it, it will chase out everything else. Um, I don't see a lot of butterfly um, egg laying and that kind of thing. I see more, I've seen more monarchs this year than before. Mm -hmm. The other piece of question is that my orange butterfly weed is um, really settled in and very happy and is reproducing everywhere. Wonderful. And should I just let that go? Should I just let go the things that are the coneflowers and the black eyed Susans and just let things go where they will? Well, that depends on your gardening style and if, if you're an interventionist gardener or more of a laissez-faire gardener. Mm -hmm. I tend to be more of a laissez-faire gardener because I don't think I'm gonna outsmart those plants. 
I agree. <laughs> so that's my opinion. And so when I put in a garden, I put in the plants in that garden and then I kind of let them do their own thing, sort themselves out. And as long as there's nothing really taking over, like you're saying, you might have to edit some of the milkweeds, but right. they're, easily, they're easily pulled for a season. Right. Okay, it doesn't take very long. So a little bit of editing, just like any garden, will go a long ways. But in, okay. in my prairie gardens, I just kind of let them, the plants find their way. And some, some plants disappear. Some of them aren't that long lived. That's right. So you look at some of these plants and I classify plants. You have annuals, you have biennials, and then you have very short lived perennials, three to five years. And then you have intermediate perennials, five to 10 years. Then you have more long lived perennials, 10 to 20. And then you have the, the Methuselahs that live 20 years or more. And then the 50 year plus species. And there are prairie species that are documented to live over 50 years. Some of them can live as long as trees. Yes, okay, thank so you. So as your garden evolves, those early successional plants, the five to 10 years, three to fives and five to tens are going to decrease in, in population and may actually disappear. And you will actually see, for instance, in a prairie garden and in a seeded prairie and in a field that's let go. If you look at the concept of ecological succession of a plowed field that is just allowed to grow up to different weeds, grasses, flowers, et cetera, the same thing is true with a prairie when you seed it is that you will typically see the maximum diversity in terms of total number of species usually around year 12 to 15. Okay. And then the long-term perennials settle in, squeeze out some of the shorter term early successional species, and you'll see actually a drop in plant diversity after year 15 in general, and then it will level off. Hmm. And that's just, that's true of almost any plant community, grassland plant community that's been planted or allowed to grow up wild. So you see the same evolution in a garden. You'll see the shorter lived plants start to drop off over time. Unless you have some sort of form of, of disturbance. So if you burn your garden, you may open up some soil and some of those dormant seeds may germinate and those plants will repopulate. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm happy to say that the butterfly weed is one of my favorites. So I will let it go. Did you, did you collect the seed locally or get it from a local, uh, local source? No. It, you know, it was a nursery plant. Mm -hmm. Whether it is the official prairie version, I don't know. Well, there are many different sources and you know, what astounds me is that you have all these rules of thumb and how far you can move plants and so on and so forth and what's a sustainable population, but we don't really know. And I used to be a, a pretty much an ecotype fundamentalist where I didn't plant anything more than 200 miles from its point of origin. Um, but what I found was um, early on, I sent my parents some plants from Wisconsin, central Wisconsin to St. Louis, which is about five degrees latitude difference, which is way, way beyond what would be considered appropriate. And many of those plants did just fine. Now, did they create sustainable, re, uh, sustainable populations that are able to reproduce? I don't really have data on it. But I mean, they had plants that lived for 20 years, butterfly weeds and prairie drop seeds and little blue stems and spider worts that, that did surprisingly well. So sometimes the plants don't read the book. Thank you. Thank you. Jack, you're on mute. Professor Jack, you're on mute. That's a, Neil, I was, I was, you reminded me of another business opportunity, which is to, um, to create um, a source of New England native plants uh, grown in New England. Um, it's starting to happen on a small basis. I know some, some folks that have some uh, machines to collect uh, blue stem seeds from existing meadows and, and so forth. Um, and, and some of the, you know, like the, um, the native plant trust, um, you know, they, but it's a very small scale operation. They, they, can't, they can't provide pounds of seed. Um, yeah. it's, it's tiny, tiny quantities. But I, I, I sense with, um, with changes in popular preference that there's definitely some long-term business opportunities for this. I would think so. And um, I know that New England Wildflower Society made a great push to produce native seeds for the region. And I don't know what has become of that, but I know that they have made some very significant. <coughs> yeah, and they have a, um, they have a substantial nursery, mo mostly for woody, woody plants, some herbaceous, but they're, um, to my knowledge, they're not, they're not marketing seed. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, they're, they're marketing plants. Sure. And, and you know, in order to grow seeds, you need a large area. Yeah. In order to be competitive, you have to have mechanization, like combines harvesting them and, and farm equipment to manage the field. So you, if you don't have, you know, 
half an acre or an acre or multi acres of some of these, you're not going to be cost effective because you don't have the economies of scale. Because I started out with none of it. It was all hand collected. I was a hunter gatherer driving around on the sides of the roads and railroads collecting seeds by hand, which then gave me carpal tunnel and, and a later part of my age and my life. But I mean, that's what it was. And Neil was just the weed collector. All the people in the in three county area knew Neil the weed collector. And so I collected these seeds until we finally had enough to start like an acre of little blue stem. I cannot tell you what a wonderful experience it was to have an acre of little blue stem. And then to have this old John Deere 30 pull behind combine from 1954, harvest the little blue stem instead of doing it by hand. It was like a miracle, an absolute miracle. But nobody can start that business now like that because there, there's larger companies that that can enforce lower prices because of, of mechanization. So it's more there are, there are barriers to entry in that market unless you have some deep pockets to generate those kinds of economies of scale, unless you have a customer base that's willing to pay a higher price for local leaf type seed while they get started. So. Yeah, one um, one quick example um, on Martha's Vineyard. There's a this a you know the, the the New England version of the prairies are our sand plain grasslands. Yes, and, and they're um, they're very special, and very diverse. Um, but so they want to um, to maintain the integrity of, of the seed. So they're the, the conservation organizations like the Nature Conservancy, who tend to have larger properties, are starting to collect the seed from those and use them on other uh, larger larger scale plantings. That's so great. It's starting to happen. Sure. And you know what? What some people do is that when you get those larger scale plantings, um, you can run a combine through them and harvest some of the seeds. Unfortunately because the seeds ripen at variable times, you're not going to get all the species, but you can hit it at a certain time and you get this, this big mishmash of all different little blue stem and forbs of varying concentrations, but you can use that for seeding other areas with that local leafotite material on a larger scale. And then you can okay. hand collect some other species to add to that to supplement to get the diversity you want. That's what some people are doing. Very good. Do we have any other questions in the queue, Nathan? Mason, you're muted. Oh, sorry, not right now, but uh, we did have a lot of thank yous in the in the um, chat. Good. Yes. So um, I think we're we're I think we're finished, Neil. Thanks a lot for um, giving us a lot to think about and um, remember, and um, some some good advice to to point in the right direction. Just just what I was hoping for when when I invited you. So thanks very much. Thank very you. Nice. And if um, if you want to do a more in depth um, on the details of meadow restoration procedures and management, I'd be more than happy to do that if that would be appropriate. And we can, we can, and what, what a lot of times I do is it's an open forum and the participants ask the questions. Yeah, yeah. And I can just address those questions because that way they get the answers that they came for if that's something you'd be interested in. I don't, just an option. Sure. Yeah, maybe, um, maybe through our local um, chapter of landscape architects.